Okay, uh, let's uh, let's get started then. Um, I'm Richard. Um, I work at J Clarity, who do kind of performance tuning and tooling stuff. I also help out a bit in the London Java community, especially on the JCP side of things. Helped out a bit on DevOps UK, especially Java SE track. So it's good, and you know, I hope everyone here has been enjoying the conference so far. Um, today I'm going to be talking about CPU caching. Uh, which is kind of an interesting topic. I hope there's some good takeaways for people. I think, hope it's useful for some of you, and I hope it's interesting for all of you. Um, first thing I want to talk about a little bit why you might want to care about this topic. What's the kind of motivations? You know, why is it relevant for you guys today? Um, then I'll talk about a little bit about hardware fundamentals. I don't want to talk this to turn into a hardware talk because those kind of talks are like interesting but entirely useless because you just don't know what to do with all that hardware detail. Um, I'm going to talk about measurement which is absolutely essential if you want to kind of understand your behavior and do any kind of tuning. I'm going to kind of give some general principles and examples of what might be good, what might be bad, things you can do, that kind of stuff. So, why do you care about CPU caching? Well, over time, CPUs have gotten a lot more complicated. There's this fantastic Moore's Law with transistor counts doubling every one year to 18 months to two years, depending upon whose version you believe. Uh, clock speeds keep on going up, more cores. Unfortunately, the average uh, clock rate increase of main memory over the last decade has been 9% per year. That's a lot slower. And the bottleneck between the CPU and the memory is also not going up in speed anywhere near as fast as CPUs. Now, this means that you have these fantastic, huge numbers of transistors, lots of cores, but you need to make sure they get data in order to be able to do anything useful with them whatsoever. So, the hardware-related solution to that is to put a cache between your main memory and your CPU. And the basic idea, I mean, probably everyone's familiar with the idea of a cache in general. You know, you, your, your core demands some data. If it's in the cache, there's a hit. If it's not in the cache, there's a miss. If there's a hit, the data gets returned from the cache. If there's a miss, it gets looked up in main memory, and then it's stored in the cache. Um, and the key point about CPU caches is that it's kind of it's an economic trade-off. Okay? You can afford memory that's very, very fast, but very fast memory is also very expensive. So you have a small amount of it in your CPU cache. Um, now, over time, people kind of realize that actually this kind of economic trade-off of going, well, we can afford a small amount of memory and it's very fast, can kind of be applied to multiple layers. So, kind of the Sandy Bridge chips have a bunch of physical cores. So, for example, this laptop has four physical cores, and each of those physical cores has two logical cores, or hardware threads, you might hear them, on each core. Each core is then fed by a level one cache, which is split into data and instructions that get directly executed. And below that level one cache is again a per physical core level two cache. Level three cache is shared between all of these cores. Now that's kind of important and relevant when you come to software tuning because this is a shared hardware resource between multiple threads and these aren't. Okay, so the concept of a CPU stall, you've spent however much money on kitting out your new data center with a huge number of very expensive and fast CPUs. You want to use them to their best, okay? A stall is when a CPU can't execute. There are actually a bunch of reasons why you can't, why you stall, but at the moment, we're just worrying about memory-related ones, worrying about cache-related ones. And the key point is, stalls displace computation. Whenever your CPU is sitting around idle, lazy, unemployed, it is not doing what you want it to do. It's not doing what you've paid it for it to do. Now, hardware-wise, again, there's a bunch of strategies to account for this. So, hyper-threading in modern Intel chips is one example of this, where you try and run multiple things, and when one hardware thread stalls, you run the other hardware thread. Out-of-order execution is another strategy as well. Um, and we're talking about cache misses here, so we're talking about how bad is a miss. These numbers are specific to my laptop, but 
you'll find modern chips have a similar kind of kind of trade-off. So obviously, if you've got your data in a register, you're hunky-dory, you've got no latency to get that data to a register because it's already there. The level one cache latency is about three clock cycles. Nine at level two, 21 at level three, and once you hit main memory, it's hundreds. Now, 150 to 400 is a fairly broad number, and that's because it depends a lot on your hardware, your main memory, <clears throat> A huge variety of different factors. But the key point is that it's, it's, it's absolutely an order of magnitude difference between the latencies. And if you're sitting there waiting for that data to come into your CPU, you're going to displace a lot of potential execution time waiting on memory. Uh, yeah. So the other thing to think about in terms of the broad hardware overview is a cache line. So data is transferred in cache lines. That's the atomic unit of data coming in to your cache. It doesn't come in any smaller. It doesn't come in any bigger. If you need to have something that doesn't fit into one cache line, you need to bring in multiple cache lines. It's a fixed size block of memory. So modern chips are kind of all 64 bytes. Um, I have actually no idea why they picked 64 bytes, but one presumes there's some incredibly well-documented empirical research that derives this number. Yeah, right. Um, and it's also purely a hardware consideration. So you can't ever tell your CPU, don't load this cache line, load this cache line. You can't ever directly say, mess with the cache line. If you want to affect the way behavior works at the caching level, you have to do it in a kind of indirect manner. You have to do it in terms of memory layout, data layout, access alignment, things like that. So um, this guy on the left, who I'm sure is a perfectly reasonable human being, and probably I'm unfairly putting a red line through him, um, is a guy called Ulrich Drepper, who actually works on maintaining glibc. And he's written this kind of interesting document called What Every Programmer Needs to Know About Memory, which is really well researched, really well, really well written. If you've got you know, a couple of weekends that you don't need to want to spend with your family or whatever, go and read through it. It's great. It's not what every programmer needs to know about memory. It's what people who work on glibc need to know about memory. Okay? Uh, so don't worry if you don't know all the hardware details or understand all the hardware details. The point is you understand enough of the basic principles to make some kind of benefit. So key architectural takeaways. If you remember only three bullet points from this section, remember these. Modern CPUs have multi-level caches. Cache misses call CPU stalls. Stalls are expensive. So when you want to do any kind of performance tuning or analysis or whatever, you kind of want to take some kind of measurement. Um, you know, you're maybe familiar with execution profilers. You may be familiar with memory profilers, GC logs, VM stat, all that kind of thing. For measure, a lot of those things don't account for CPU level measurements. So you kind of need a different approach. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So first of all, before you measure anything related to your CPU cache, stop. Think, is this really the problem that I'm having? Because it's for most people, for most people, it's not directly the problem you're going to have necessarily on that day. Firstly, not all problems are dependent upon your CPU speed. Maybe you have network contention. Maybe you have disk I.O. contention. Maybe you're dependent upon an external service run by some SaaS provider, which is written in Ruby and terrible. Um, maybe you are reliant upon an incompetent central IT systems, poor provisioning of database servers, all sorts of other problems which are utterly unrelated to CPU caches. Have a look at these guys first. Have a methodology, measure them, ensure it's not the problem. When you know you have a performance problem that's dependent upon actually executing your code on your CPU and you know roughly where in your application it is, then you can start looking at CPU measurement. So the way you measure kind of performance related events that are related to the CPU caches is using uh, performance counters and architectural events. So whenever you get uh, certain on-chip architectural events like a cache miss, a cache hit, a branch mispredict, all the kind of low-level hardware stuff, there is an event. 
that the CPU can count. And CPUs have these registers called performance event counters that let you count these events. By counting the events, you can know what's good, what's bad, how much time you're spending wasted on these kind of things. These are model-specific registers. That's to say they are not standardized as part of x86. They differ from chip to chip and from manufacturer to manufacturer. Um, now, usually with Intel chips, the, counter, the events that are supported on more recent chips are a superset of those on older chips. But sometimes the architecture might change and it's just not appropriate to account a certain type of event anymore, so they deprecate it. Um, don't worry too much about the actual underlying stuff because there's a bunch of tooling which just takes care of this shit for you. And Intel have, again, another fantastically huge PDF document called the Intel Software Developer's Manual, which is about 4,000 pages. Um, don't ever read the whole of this document. It has like pages and pages of tables at the end, which are just like some incomprehensible name followed by two numbers. Fantastic stuff. Anyone who's written tooling has read that document. It's not a pleasant document. So what you might want to measure. Instructions retired. The concept of an instruction being retired is that it's executed to completion. So if, there's, if it's a speculative out of order execution thing and then you don't care about the result, they're not counted. When you're stalled, you're not retiring instructions. So uh, instruction retirement rates give you a way of kind of having a positive metric to say, I want to maximize this. I want this to be as close to the maximum possible instructions retired. And you know what the maximum retirement rate is because it's your um, clock cycle times the number of cores you're running. Um, Cache misses can be measured on a level-by-level level basis. So you remember earlier we talked about level 3 cache being shared between different cores and levels 1 and 2 not. This is one of the reasons why you can measure the hit-miss rates on a per, ca on a per cache level basis because it allows you to understand whether you're actually doing something quite effectively on a per-core cache, but if you're having a, a resource contention problem on your shared cache. You can measure hits, you can measure, you can measure misses, and you can also measure reads versus writes, depending upon what you, what you want to do. Something which I've found to be quite useful is to calculate the ratio, so you know that if you're, you're, you're between 0 and 100, and you, you have a vague idea of what's a good or bad number there, because you know if your, your miss rate's 0%, everything's perfect, you'll never get 0, but everything would be perfect if it was 0, and if you're hitting 100, everything is terrible. You'll probably not get 100, but you might get something close to it. Uh, there's a bunch of cache profilers, so this is the kind of tool you need to look at in, in the space. The uh, kind of preferred open source tool is the, the perf tool, which comes with Linux. Um, so caveat, I wrote most of JClarity JMSR, which is our tool for doing this kind of thing. Intel and AMD have their own tooling support. So Intel have VTune, AMD have Code Analyst, and is, is anyone using Windows on the server in the audience? Nope. Well, Visual Studio also has support for it if you're using Windows on the server, which probably no one is. Um, so good benchmarking practice obviously applies with CPU caches. So Warm up your code, make sure you're jitted, make sure you've uh, you, you, you ruled everything out. But there are a few cache-specific ideas or general ideas that become more important with CPU caches. So, um, this graph here is actually showing you, and there's a few of these graphs, um, I th think... Yes, blue is level 2, red is level 3, and this is the miss rate as a percentage. So 35 here means 35% of um, memory accesses are misses. Um, so this, ignore the nonsense in the middle, I'll come to that on the next slide. This is one working set of data. This is another working set of data. So this is at 35% miss rate, and this is at 5. This code is like absolutely identical and the same. And just one of them is blowing out cache. One of them is just a lot bigger than the other. And because um, caching is based upon the size of your data set, 
and kind of a statistical property, you need to make sure that when you're working with a data set, that it's representative of what your real world program is. It's kind of important. The other thing is, and this is something which applies to all benchmarking, but it's, it's very important when it's a statistical concept like caching. Good benchmarks have low variance. You see in the middle of this graph, there's something that looks a bit like a straight line. That's predictable behavior. You see on the left and on the right, there's higgledy, piggledy, wiggledy lines. That's nonsense. If you see this in a benchmark, your benchmark's unreliable. If it looks like you're measuring random noise, you are probably measuring random noise. So, key takeaway, you can measure your caching performance. There's tooling available, and that means if you want to uh, tune or optimize this kind of thing, you are, in the words of Charlie Sheen, winning. Uh, so let's talk about a little bit about some kind of principles and examples in terms of sequential code. So um, CPU caches perform what's known as prefetching. So the prefetcher is the kind of part of it's eagerly loading data, so eager like Sylvester the cat. Um, and the idea is that if you've accessed certain types of data or in certain locations, you might then access other types of data around the same time. So there's one way you can do it is you can load adjacent cache lines. So if you've loaded one cache line, it'll start prefetching the next one before there's even a requirement for it, and then that data will be in the CPU. There's also a kind of streaming prefetch where it's just like constantly grabbing the next bit of data. The problem is that predicting the future um, is obviously a very hard thing, and especially when it's a CPU that's trying to predict the future. So what you want to do is you want to arrange your data so that you're making the job as easy and predictable for the prefetcher as possible. So, how do you do that? We have this concept of locality of reference, which comes in three forms. There's temporal locality, so that's when you're referring to the same data in a short period of time, and what that means is that this data has been loaded into your CPU cache and is there and available when you want to use it again. The next thing, and this is prefetch related is spatial locality. So referring to data that's close together in memory so that when you get these kind of block loads and this prefetching, you're kind of targeting stuff that's similar. And the other idea is sequential locality. So sequential locality is a special case of spatial locality where your data access is a linear in memory. So, um, so a few things in terms of general principles, that we'll, we'll, we'll look at some examples in a sec, but using smaller data types is kind of important, and using less memory is kind of important. And there's a few, I'm going to talk a little bit about a few more esoteric things as we go along, but basically, if your application is creating like 200 megabytes a second of garbage, it doesn't matter what other stuff you're going to do, just please don't do that, fix that kind of problem first. Um, compressed loops can help you use smaller data types. Avoiding big holes in your data, because obviously this kind of screws up these sequential and spatial locality problems, and making accesses as linear as possible, so that when you're getting that kind of streaming data prefetch, it's nice and easy to predict. So, here's uh, a, some kind of primitive array in Java. Now, primitive arrays are sequentially laid out in memory. So index i is right next to index i plus 1 in your array. So this kind of guy has predictable access. If you were to start skipping um, through the array, so kind of you look at one point and then you skip a bit and then you look at another point, you kind of get worse uh, caching performance. Um, so here's an interesting graph. Um, random noise. Brilliant start. This part is, um, has a skip of one. So it's accessing the next section in, as it goes along. That's two, that's four, and right up at the top, that's eight. So as you can see, sequential accesses, they're kind of fitting, fitting, fitting pretty well inside your CPU cache. Um, and then as you start skipping with these holes, you see your miss rate just fly through the roof. And you can see it starts seeing the level 3 miss rate going up there. And if you were to make your skips really big, your level 3 miss rate would also fly through the roof as well. And that's, bear in mind, all those misses are 
displacing computation, stalled CPU. Multidimensional arrays in Java aren't really multidimensional arrays. They're arrays of arrays. So even if you have a multidimensional array of primitives, that primitive is aligned sequentially in memory, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the other arrays are next to it. <clears throat> so people start to realign their accesses. So they'll have a single array and then just index into it using this kind of formula here. So um, this is basically mapping a 2D data structure into a 1D data structure. Um, now, the thing you want to be aware of is if your accesses are going in terms of the row, you can, you've got to jump at some point, no matter which way you do it. But if you're, doing, if you're accessing in terms of the row on your innermost hot loops, you want those rows to be the things that are next to each other in memory. And you only want to have a big jump when you hit the column. So, if you put your strides the right way, you get a nice low miss ratio of about 30%. This again is this, like, I've got literally the same code here, it's just I've changed the formula to stride by column instead of by row. And that's blown the miss rate out of the water up to nearly 100%. It's probably, probably noise that it's not 100%, to be honest. Um, and what this guy is doing is it's going, I'll jump to the next column. I'll jump to the next column. And you've got huge holes in your access alignment. Java heap layout is sadly not our friend when we're kind of cache tuning. So if you've got a class, foo, and you've got a bunch of other objects popping off of it, and you've got an array of foo called foos, each of these elements in the array is not consecutively lined out in memory. You've got uh, an object there, and then it'll point to some foo instance, and then each of that will end up pointing off to the different instances of it. So it's very hard to make those kind of guarantees when you're using Java heat layout. So it's kind of a serious Java weakness. We'll talk about it a bit later. The, the location's hard to guarantee relative to each other. And this does, Im does, this does impede us. There's also the kind of garbage collector impact. Now, actually, in terms of squishing objects together in memory, garbage collectors are generally quite good. <coughs> Uh, so Mark Sweep pushes things together, and when you have a copying collector, like Eden collectors in uh, Hotspot, um, because they copy only the live objects, the copied objects are then next to each other in memory. So it's not terrible, and the GC does try and help, but it also has an impact when you're moving things around. But there are still a bunch of basic data layout principles. If you've got a collection of primitives, don't use the box type because you've got that extra memory access indirection on every box. Use them like GNU Trove, or there's loads of libraries. Our linked lists versus arrays. Linked lists, again, have the same property, where it's very hard to make linked list-related things work as fast as arrays, because you've got that additional memory access hops. And the same thing with kind of hash tables versus search trees about compaction. So code bloating is probably not a huge one in Java, but Java 8 will include a bit more options to the JIT compiler. Um, GCC, if you put it on a high optimization level, will try and unroll your loops, which bloats out the amount of code. Um, I mean, I, I have had a micro benchmark in GCC that when you switch its optimization level from 02 to 03, it actually goes 17 times slower because it just blows the data cache out of the water entirely, and then it's you're just not in a nice place. There are also custom data structures. I'm not going to go through how these guys work, but the key points to understand is that, when, is that there are custom data structures out there that have cache-friendly uh, alignment and are optimized for caches. Judy arrays specifically have a whole load of kind of complexity associated with trying to get good caching behavior. <clears throat> but be aware, most of the time, Judy arrays don't even perform as well as hash tables. So they're like, they're like a kind of map implementation. KD trees are like, if you kind of want to search in a space, 
uh, like say you want to find you've got you like location of one town you want to find what the other what the closest other town is so they're a kind of general a tree that's ordered by space so they're quite clever and a z order curve is you remember earlier we were talking about taking access alignments for 2d data and making them in 1d data z order curves are a generalized form of that kind of approach that works for multi-dimensional data so i think some people who do kind of games programming use use that kind of thing where they have a lot of three-dimensional uh, representations so I'm going to cover a little bit of a like a I don't recommend people do this by the way um, I'm going to cover like a kind of if you're in that situation where you, you you've you've looked at the Java heap layout and you've decided that you really need to have sequentially in memory laid out objects it is possible to do in Java so by default you have kind of got your kind of this is some kind of pojo effectively we don't really care what it is you've got a bunch of fields and you've got a bunch of getters and setters and these objects will be everywhere, and you, and you kind of want to guarantee they're sequentially lined out. So it's possible to do that by using SunMisk Unsafe to directly allocate memory. So there's a dot, dot, dot at the top line. There's a horrific reflection thing to get an instance of Unsafe. Just Google it if you want to actually write this. I'm not going to cover why that happens. Um, now, you need to figure out how much total space to allocate for these things. So you've got the count of your number of objects times the size of each object, which you can calculate by knowing how big each field is. You allocate some memory using this space, and then when you get your player attack object, instead of constructing it normally, just pass in the address of that index into the constructor. Now, your new player attack object is going to have some kind of offset for each field that tells you how far into it <coughs> you need to go. So you can calculate the address by taking the, the start of the object plus the offset and doing a kind of get int or a set int, depending upon whether you want to get or set things. Um, so that does give you guaranteed alignment. Unfortunately, manually writing it is time consuming, error prone, you'll segfault the JVM, you'll be very unhappy, and all the rest of the stuff. So I have actually written a prototype library called Slab, which just does all this stuff under the hood for you. So in Slab, you just define an interface with some getters and setters, and then you call a factory method to get an allocator, allocate a bunch of memory. So this game event is now a flyweight that can move over a sequentially allocated block of objects. So there's a method to move you to that point, and then you can just call the guests and setters normally. If you want to have some logic and not just a boring pojo, you can always just use an abstract class instead of an interface. That'll work fine as well. Um, I don't recommend many people do this. This is one of those, like, it's a particular solution for a particular problem with a particular set of trade-offs, but maybe you're in that space where you kind of have those trade-offs. Um, data alignment. So an address is n byte aligned when, and so addresses end up having to be a power of two, what, don't want to cover particularly why, but your address is n byte aligned when that address is divisible by n. Okay? And we say it's cache line aligned when you're byte aligned to the size of a cache line. So what that means is that your addresses fit at the beginning of a cache line. Um, so there's a few rules you need to understand about alignment in Java. Java has this love of 8-byte um, alignment. When I say Java, I really mean hotspot. I don't know if you're using some other kind of JVM as to, 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 to how that works out. But if, if you new up a Java object, it'll be 8-byte aligned. Um, if you call unsafe to allocate memory, it'll be 8-byte aligned. If you have a byte buffer that's directly allocated, it'll be 8-byte aligned. Indirect byte or keep byte buffers um, were also 8 byte aligned up till Java 6, but I think they've changed it in Java 7. You can also get, if you want to worry about your alignment and understand where your actual in memory location is, you can actually get the address of your unsafe and your byte buffer. So unsafe actually literally gives you a long, which is the address. So, you know, you can work out whether that's aligned or not based upon. Uh, modulo arithmetic. And byte buffer has a field that's called address that's private, but you know, if you're in a horrible world where you're doing optimization, you might need to get that as well. Now, cache, aligned, cache line aligned access has significant benefits in terms of 
um, the speed that you'll get. So on kind of Core 2 Duo class machines, it's like uh, three to six times faster for reads. On Nihil M, it's like one and a half times. I think Sandy Bridge is about one and a half times. Um, I'm very much relying on this guy who's done some good, quite good measurement of research. So the way he measured it was he used the byte buffers, got the address, allocated slightly more memory than he needed, and then pushed up the difference between where his address was and the beginning of the next cache line, and then he could have nicely aligned address access. And this is, this, these kind of performance speed-up comparisons are comparing mid-aligned, so that's when your accesses always fit within a cache line, to straddling accesses where you're kind of partly on one side of the cache line and partly on the other. Um, so, um, this section, if you take away one thing, try and make your data look like cheddar and not emmental is basically the goal. So you kind of want things continuously aligned, accesses aligned, a block of slab, rather than huge holes in the middle of your data, or in the middle of your data accesses. So, um, we're going to cover translation look-aside buffers. If you happen to Google some of these terms, please make sure you Google for TLB and not TLAB, because that's a thread local allocation buffer and a garbage collector, which is totally different and unrelated. <sighs> False cognates, don't you love them? So, quick recap, I'm sure everyone understood how virtual memory worked at one point in time in their life, and then forgot it, and then today happens, so I'll just recap briefly. Bear in mind, RAM is finite. It's also fragmented between different processes because the way multitasking operating systems work. We like multitasking operating systems. We do want to run multiple processes at the same time. That's useful, practical, business value adding. Programming, on the other hand, is a lot easier if you pretend your address space is contiguous. You might ignore that if you're in Java, but it's easier for people to write in the JVM. And anyone who's writing C code or C++, this does make your life easier. So your virtual addresses all end up being contiguous. Some of them may point to addresses in RAM. Some of them may point to addresses on the disk. And there might be a gap between where they are in RAM or on disk. Um, the way uh, the virtual memory is implemented is using page tables. So the virtual address space is split into pages in the same way that cache is split into cache lines. And the page table has two addresses. So one of them is the address in the virtual memory, and one of them is the address in the physical memory or on disk, and the page table is mapping between them. It's OS managed, and you know there's, there's low-level interaction between your CPU and your OS. So, Translation look-aside buffers are an on-CPU cache for page table accesses, which means that virtual memory is not prohibitively expensive, because otherwise you would spend all of your time looking up in memory where your addresses are in memory. So, CPU cache. TLBs are multi-level, in the same way that CPU caches are multi-level, and there's some kind of... I won't go too much into the details of the interaction there, because it can get quite hairy, but um, it may or may not need to do a TLB access to look something up in a CPU cache. The hit-miss rate for TLBs is measurable by uh, CPU counters. That can be quite useful, we'll come to this in a bit later, when trying to work out what the cost is for um, r running multiple processes and how much you get hit in terms of your TLB. And the other thing that you can measure is the walk duration, um, which I'll come to in a, in a sec. So the walk duration is how many the cost in terms of CPU cycles that it takes to look something up in a in a TLB. So when you have a context switch, so when you change from one process to another, you change your virtual address space. Historically. What this meant was it flushed the whole of the TLB out, which was just horrific. Nowadays, modern CPUs use address space identifiers, which um, basically means every entry in the page table knows what virtual memory address space it's associated with, so it only needs to kill the ones which actually need to get killed. Um, which massively reduces, which removes the need for these big flush type things. I think ARM, previously to version 6 of ARM processors doesn't have an address space identifier. I don't know if anyone here, anyone here using programming on ARM? No, I didn't think so. Um, 
Now, there's a trade-off in terms of the size of your virtual memory pages. So bigger pages means less pages means the lookup is cheaper. But bigger pages means you're wasting more memory space because you can only allocate memory at the size of a page. And it also potentially means that if you're wasting too much memory, you start disk paging. And then it doesn't matter how bad your CPU caching behavior is because it'll get totally dominated by disk IO. So um, page sizes are consequently adjustable. And they have, because there's a TLB cache interaction, they're adjustable on chip. Most BIOSes or operating systems have some well-documented function that lets you do this. So common sizes on Intel chips are like four kilobytes, two megabytes, or a gigabyte. Um, be wary in some documentation, two megabytes is described as huge, and one gigabyte is described as large which is an interesting uh, description. Sometimes changing the page size can have a huge and easy speed up, like literally flick a switch, get 30% type speed up. And if you're using a JVM, you need to provide this command line option to say, actually use the damn things. Oracle databases conveniently love large pages just in the same way as Oracle CEOs love gratuitously large yachts. Um, so your TLDR on TLBs is virtual memory and paging has an overhead. Translation look aside buffers are used to reduce the cost of this overhead and they're tunable in terms of the page size and you can measure that again using uh, CPU counters and also obviously you kind of want to correlate it back to actually real world performance improvements once you've done it and it's kind of potentially an easy speed up for some people. So, we're going to look at a couple more kind of principles and examples, and this time I'm going to talk a little bit about concurrent code. So, context switching, again, we talk, mentioned this earlier where it kind of, that's the process of switching between processes, though you can be a little bit more specific, because actually nowadays the term context switch is overloaded to talk about threads, processes, and if you're on a virtualized system, a virtualized OS. Though obviously, if you're in one of these situations where you're using like um, Waratech, for example, or if you're using one of these situations where instead of having virtualized OSs, you work share within the same, J within the same JVM, you don't have to worry about this guy. Um, or if you're just using bare metal. Um, so the threads, because threads share an address space, they don't have the translation look-aside buffer costs when you do a context switch, which is nice. And bear in mind, a thread in Java does correspond to this type of thread, not a process. But you still might need to understand the process cost if, you're switch, if you've, say, got a database and a JVM on the same box. So costs, by costs, I mean, you know, computational costs of context switching come in two forms. The direct cost of actually implementing the context switch. So to do that, you take the state of all your registers and your process and your stack, save it somewhere. You then have to run your scheduler to decide what process takes that slot. And then you have to load the state of the next process that comes in from memory. So those are kind of direct costs. Um, there's also a bunch of indirect costs that come around with context switching. So if you're switching between actual processes rather than threads, there's the reloading of the translation look aside buffer. Your CPU pipeline has to flush. And there's also cache interference. So it might be that your new process wants a lump of data from a different part of memory from your old process. So that interferes. And the other thing is, we were talking earlier about temporal locality. So that's looking at the same piece of data re recently. Obviously, if you kind of get scheduled and pushed off the processor and then brought back later, that kind of ruins your concept of temporal locality. So context switching can be very expensive. How expensive? There's actually this quite good paper by a bunch of researchers called Quantifying the Cost of a Context Switch. It's like five or six years out of date now, so the numbers are not, in terms of the raw timing numbers, they're not the same timings that you'll get today. But the principles and the trade-off probably does still apply. So they measured the cost of direct context switching, so all the low-level instruction-y OSE stuff at 3.8 microseconds. They measured their indirect context switching. So what they were doing was they had an array-bound benchmark, which they tried a variety of different access alignment and striding things to get a variety of different uh, data. <coughs> 
And they measured how long it took as you ramped up the number of context switches. So how slow that process goes uh, gives you a measure of how much the cost of the cache interference and the, locality, the temporal locality screws you. And they have indirect costs. It's like jumping from, obviously, if you have a really small block of data, which like, so you can fit them from all of your processes into the same block of memory, it's zero. And that gets up to like 1,500 microseconds in some of the worst cases. So this is really horrific. It's not going to be as bad as that raw number today, but percentage-wise, it can be. And bear in mind that this is switching between processes, not threads. So it is less for threads. Um, one of the key things they found was the switch between the direct costs and the indirect costs. So when all your caching effects start killing you rather than the actual cost of the OS, is when your working set, so that's the data you're actually using in memory, gets bigger than your L2 cache. It is possible for you to get cooperative hits. So that's where a different thread has accessed the same area of memory or related bit of memory and has consequently caused the thing that you want to actually be in the cache. This is like fantastic, but compared with the cost of these guys, it's like winning the lottery sometimes. Minimize context switching if possible. Just like try not to have a huge amount of context switching. And, and this is something which applies quite Quite simply, you know, just don't think that by making your thread pool huge or spawning thousands of threads on a four-core box, you're going to make things better because you'll probably make them a lot worse. So, uh, locking is another kind of concurrency thing that's, you know, done. Um, locks require a kernel arbitration, so that means that when you say, I've got two things competing for lock, it ends up being arbitrated in kernel space. That doesn't, uh, so caveat, that doesn't apply for Java 5 star locks, but it does apply for synchronized. It doesn't generate a context switch to go into kernel space, but it does have a mode switch, which again has a bit of cache interference between the CPU and you. And lots of context switching uh, can happen when you've got lots of lock contention and your CPU is trying to hot swap something in so something can make progress. And it's got this cache pollution cost. The solution is to try lock free algorithms somewhat, with obviously the caveats that these are hard to work with, but probably you can kind of worry, I would worry a lot more about context switching costs than locking. So the Java memory model is really, really nice. It gives you loads of these really good guarantees about things like the volatile keyword. The volatile keyword in C++ is just a nightmare. It's just useless. Uh, well, I shouldn't say useless, but it's not got a very strong guarantee. In Java, it has quite strong guarantees that if you've got multiple threads uh, reading and writing to it, that writes are visible from other threads. Now, this dude, despite being very useful, is turtles all the way down. At the Java level, you've got the volatile keyword. In terms of what happens at the x86 assembler, if you look, dump your assembler and look at what happens, all the reads and writes to that variable will have this lock directive sitting by them, which is basically telling your CPU, seriously, dude, don't mess with this stuff. Make sure the ordering is uh, ordering guarantees are kept. At the cache level, there's this protocol called Messy. Intel and AMD CPUs use slightly different variants, but everything uses some kind of cache protocol to keep the coherence working. This has a huge cost. I was talking to someone in the pub on Monday who had a class hierarchy with a right to a volatile variable in the constructor at the top level of their class hierarchy. Um, now, the problem with this is, when you execution profile, it tells you you're spending loads of time running your constructor. It doesn't tell you why you're doing that. It just looks like you're writing to a couple of variables, like most constructors do. It's just not the kind of thing that you can see with an execution profiler. It's not the kind of thing that you can see with a memory profiler. It's the kind of thing that you can, it's the kind of cost you can only see with um, a cache profiler, where you'll know that your actual per core memory accesses are not terrible, but you have these horrible flushes. And you have a lot of memory read and write 
but it looks, when you look at, compare it to your GC logs, it looks like you're not necessarily doing that much memory, your ob object read and write. False sharing is another concurrency related problem. So um, the point is that data can share a cache line. Generally, this is good because you want to fit, you want to, you want to have to prefetch as few cache lines as possible. But sometimes data which is unrelated or that doesn't have nice memory access patterns gets accidentally put next to each other. And if you have volatile data, which is constantly being written to by multiple different threads on the same cache line, this happens. Thread zero starts writing. Thread one starts writing, and you end up spending all of your time pushing your data back and forward in a way that you really don't want to do. So people have come up with this kind of field padding solution. So you know because primitive fields in Java objects sit next to each other in memory. Um, if, you put a if you put a bunch of padding fields after that value, you don't get a false sharing between that value and another instance of that value. Uh, there's eight bytes for a long, you've got seven fields, and there's an object header, so this whole entity fits to 64 bytes, which is your cache line size on a modern Intel CPU. And also bear in mind, as I said earlier, fields get aligned to eight bytes, because Java loves eight byte alignment. Um, this is a horrible hack. Um, fortuitously, so a JEP is a Java enhancement proposal, it's a change to OpenJDK. JEP 142 is, um, provides an annotation at uncontended that you can put on a field, and then the JIT compiler solves everything. Um, this is also quite good because if you add those fields in on the previous version, in Java 7 they added optimization to remove fields that were unused. So unless you have a fake method that goes in and pretends to read those fields but is never called, the JIT compiler will potentially just deletes them anyway. But this got so, so at uncontended is a, is a, is a much better solution. Um, you can also get false sharing your garbage collector. So concurrent mark sweep, um, what it does is it keeps a card, so scanning all of your objects to see which are live is expensive. So when CMS does a rescan, um, it keeps a track of what blocks of memory get written to and what get what don't, which is put in a card marking table. And there's like, for every, I think it is 512 bytes, uh, there's like a bit in this table to say that that's been written to. And if it's not written to between scans, it just doesn't bother scanning those objects that haven't changed on the rescans. Of course, going if this has not been written to, write to it, adds you an extra if statement that has to happen every time you ever write to an object ever, which has about a 15 to 20% overhead to the GC. So they optimize this by just saying, hey, we've written to something in that card in memory, we'll just write to the bit. Unfortunately, because those bits are all lined sequentially in memory, you can get this kind of false sharing problem in your card table. There's a flag to switch it off. Don't use this unless you have a really good reason to, um, again, measure this kind of stuff before you do anything. So, concurrency takeaways. Buyer beware. Context switching has a huge cost. Take care when sizing your thread pools and... and and, and, and deciding how many threads to run. False sharing has a cost. Locking, visibility, atomicity have costs. These costs are invisible to an execution profiler. You need to measure it using MSRs. So, general summaries from the whole talk are caching behavior's got a significant performance benefit. The effects are measurable using on chip CPU counters. And there's a bunch of common problems and solutions which I've kind of outlined examples of. But don't just like jump in and go, oh, that looks like my problem. Please do measure things before you go and do any tuning. So um, that's a link to uh, Dr. Drepper's fantastic PDF document. There's a kind of mailing list of friends of, of the company I work for there, which has quite good performance tuning discussion on. 
and concurrency interest is also another good mailing list. I, I probably should have added uh, Martin Thompson, who was speaking here yesterday, has his own list called Mechanical Sympathy, which again has quite a few good discussions on this kind of topic as well. It's worth, worth following along. Even if you don't understand everything that's being said to begin with, it's the kind of thing you can pick up over time. So, I have like one minute, and it's probably less than a minute now. Uh, I don't know if anyone has any kind of questions or what have you. Shoot. Does, uh, does the hardware try to do anything to reduce thrashing between the L1 and L2 cache when it's scheduling uh, hardware presence, like uh, avoiding thrashing between the L1 and L2 cache when it's scheduling? Or is it, you know, this hardware gets the whole lot? I don't think it has any uh, cache thrash specific behavior. Um, the scheduling at that level works on basically is the CPU stalled? If so, I'll try and run this other thread and hope that it's not stalled. So I don't think it takes into account the kind of caching effects, but I'm not 100% I'm not sure on that. The, okay, so the, the, the trick to confusing a JIT compiler is have a random number somewhere and have some code that's calling another piece of code protected by this random number, and that'll confuse it like buggery. So have, have, make these fields um, public. Well, the fields don't, you don't want the fields to necessarily be static because you want them on a per object basis. But you need, you, what you really want is to have like a public static method that does some reading and writing to these fields. And I, I, I think at the moment that's sufficient to avoid confusing it, but if you really want to be safe, just put like some random number somewhere that, 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 that calls it like right at the end of your program, but you, never, you know never gets run, but whatever. Just, yeah, random numbers confuse a JIT fantastically. So. Anyone else? Cool. I think we're out of time anyway. So thank you very much for attending.